Welcome to Mountain View United Methodist Church here in Boulder, Colorado. We are glad that you chose to worship with us wherever you may find yourself, whether it's just down the street or across the country. We enjoy knowing that you are worshiping with us and I would invite you to register your attendance here. Lots of things are happening here in the church this spring as we continue to serve in our community and I want to invite you to a couple of those. On the 24th, there will be a food drive here in our parking lot. It's drive through you don't have to get out. If you just put a, open your trunk, they'll remove the food. It's going to the community food bank and you are encouraged to contribute. It's kind of a fun time to drive by. And then on Sunday, April 25th, we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the solar panels on our roof. This is in conjunction with Creation Care Sunday and also Earth Day, some of you may think of Earth Day. So we would invite you to join us for either one of those coming events. Both of them will be socially distanced, we encourage you to wear masks, and it will be a time of coming together to celebrate and to serve our community. And now I invite you to stop, to focus, and join us in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. Beloved, now we are God's children. What we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Cesareo Gabarín's music is well known and sung by English and Spanish-speaking people. We are learning it today, and hopefully it will become an important part of your best-loved hymns. Gabarín wrote about 500 songs, and in this hymn, the verses acknowledge our sin, but Christ's resurrection and the love of God bring us life's abundance, life's new joy. Christ's resurrection has freed us from the pain of our shortcomings. Camina, pueblo de Dios, camina, pueblo de Dios, where are we? Reconciliation to all things and people with God. 
you to join me in a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, be with us as we join together in worship, even though we aren't in one place. We are in many places, and yet we come together under your Spirit. We are reminded that we are to walk on, to walk on no matter what we face, knowing that you are our strength and our courage to walk on as we move forward in this time and in this day. Remind us, O Lord, in all of the ways that we are an Easter people, a people created to give praise to you, to follow Jesus, and to remember, to remember the strengths that you give to us. We come this morning, this afternoon, this evening, we come. We come acknowledging that you are our God. We come sometimes with questions of faith. Sometimes we struggle when we hear others tell us what it means to be Christians. But help us to form our own opinion, to understand a broader meaning. Be with us today as we discuss sin and think about our own. Be with those who this day are troubled who are worried or concerned or who need you in their lives in ways they can't imagine. And help the rest of us, help us to be strong, to lend your love and your light into this world. And when words fail us, help us to pray the prayer that your son taught us as we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey friends, so today I want to talk about a word that I'm sure you've all heard before, sin. We read about sin in the Bible, we say the word sin in prayers, and we might even hear the word sin in places other than church. It's a small word, right? Just three letters long. But it does make us feel some pretty big feelings when we talk about it. It might make you feel guilty or ashamed like you've done something wrong. Or maybe it makes you feel angry because no matter how hard you try, you still can't get everything right. Or maybe it makes you feel sad because you know that sins can hurt our relationships with other people. Yes, it is a small word, but it certainly packs a punch. So what is sin? Sin is all those bad choices we make. When we choose to tell our parents that our room is clean, but we know it's not, that's a sin. When we choose not to share what we have with others, that's a sin. Or when we are angry and choose words that we know are hurtful, that's a sin. 
I know all of you have done sinful things because we are all human. When we have choices to make, it is not always easy for us to make the right one. And this leads us to sin. I have sins. Your parents have sins. Your teachers have sins. Everyone in this church has sins. But here's the best part. God sees our sins and loves us anyway. How does that work? When we talk about sins here at church, we usually hear other words that follow. Words like forgiveness, words like grace, and of course, love. Just like the word sin, these words make us feel some pretty big feelings too. Forgiveness. When we sin, when we make bad choices, God is still there, ready to help us pick up the pieces and try again. Feels pretty good to know that there is nothing you can do that God won't forgive you for, right? How about grace? When we talk about God's forgiveness, we are reminded that we are all given the gift of grace, which is just another way of saying God loves us no matter what. God gives grace freely and without expecting anything from you in return. There was never anything you did to deserve God's grace, and it's a gift you can never lose. So even when we mess up and make, make bad choices, God's grace is there. And that feels pretty awesome, right? And then we have love. When it comes to sin, there is nothing we can do to keep God from loving us. In fact, God loves us so much that he calls us his family. In the Bible, we read, God has loved us so much. We are loved so much that we are called the children of God. Think about how much you love your family. You help each other, you protect each other, you enjoy being together, you feel safe and loved and treasured. That is what God's love is like for everyone in God's family. We are all God's children and we are all loved. So back to that first word, sin. It doesn't seem so bad now that we've put it with those other words, does it? Because I know that I will do my best to make the right choices. But when I mess up, I know God will forgive me. I know that the grace of God is a gift I have forever. And I know that God loves me anyway and always. So keep all these words in your hearts, friends, and think about all the ways these words make you feel. Then take those words to God and feel loved no matter what. Friends, can we pray? Hey God, thank you for your grace and love. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for loving me no matter what. We love you, God. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Okay, friends, have a great week. week.
Today is the second Sunday of Easter Tide, second Sunday following Easter, and we continue by looking at 1 John, which is the lectionary reading for the day. If you're looking for it and want to read it yourself, and I encourage you to please do that. Start at the back of your Bible, find Revelation, and then you'll see Jude, and then right before Jude is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They're very small little chapters, small little books. These letters were written to people who already knew the gospel story, people like you and I, but people who were still learning and gaining confidence in what it means to be a Christian. We're not sure who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, but we know that the words hold true today as we consider what it means to be followers of Christ in the season following Easter Sunday, as we think about who we are as Christians. Some of you are looking and saw the title, it's about sin, and you thought, surely she's not going to go there. I have to tell you, I'm debating with myself, am I going to talk about sin or not? What should I say about sin? To me, sin is a trigger word in many, for many of us. Not so much me because of how I was raised in the Methodist Church, in a fairly liberal Methodist Church that talked a lot about God's love for me and God's grace for me reminding me that I am a child of God, and just like you are all children of God. And I like that image. Let's turn to the text. This is some words from 1 John 3. I love these words. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that the world did not know Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. We are children of God, and God loves us. And as we have this hope, we are made pure. Those are great words for Christians. And I thought about just talking about grace a lot, a whole sermon on grace, because that's easy. And we're Methodists, and that's what Wesley told us was important. And I didn't want to go on, but since I'm following the lectionary, the pericope, which is a set of verses that go together, it does continue. And I was afraid, because I have a different view of this next piece than some people do. Or again, get it out, read it yourself, look it up on your phone. But hear the rest of this section and see what you think. Remember, you are a child of God. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. I don't like that part at all. But I decided maybe it's important for us to claim that word and to understand it in a different way. Sin is often used to clobber people, to say things to make them feel bad or feel guilty, to say that their behavior is wrong. I don't think that's what God means. I don't think that's what the author of this text means either. Have you ever heard that? How about this phrase? I know you've heard this, some of you. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Have you heard that one? Have you heard that used against you? If you have, I'm sorry to hear that. But I know it's real. I know people say that. I've heard church people, Christian people say to someone else, I love you, but I can't love what you're doing. And I worry. I worry about that because that phrase is often used in certain circumstances. It's often used towards people whose lifestyle we don't agree with. 
Just because someone's lifestyle is different than mine doesn't make it a sin. One time I experienced this. I had a seminary student in my congregation in a former church, and he was going to be home for Christmas Eve. He was going to be home for Christmas Eve, and we were doing a whole reading of Luke 2 with music and drama. I asked him if he'd like to be the narrator. I asked him that because when I was a seminary student, it meant a lot to get to stand up and lead God's people in church. And I asked him, I said, would you read the scriptures for the main service on Christmas Eve? And he was honored and delighted, and his parents and grandparents who attended the church were even more thrilled to get to see their grandson, to see their son, who was someday going to be a minister, lead the church in worship, or at least help with that. So I gave him the script, and I gave my secretary the information, and she started typing up the bulletin. And she came in my office, and she said, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, you can't let him read the scripture. I said, why not? She said, you know why. I said, you'll have to tell me. Said, he's a sinner, she said. I said, why is he a sinner? How would you know if he's a sinner or not? She said, well, he's a gay man. That makes him a sinner. I said, no, it doesn't. She said, you can't let a sinner read the scripture. And she said, I love him, but not his sin. I said, he's not a sinner because he's a gay man. And I said, we are all sinners. We all fall short, not because of our sexuality, but for all kinds of reasons. I said, and besides, you read scripture two weeks ago. And she said, I'm not one of them. I said, but you're still a sinner. It's not the sexuality that makes a person a sinner. We all have sinned, I bet. You could all define a time when you've sinned in your life. But when we use that expression, particularly, particularly, when we're referring to someone's sexuality, we are saying, I love you, but I don't love who God made you. You can see the problem with that. So let's just all promise not to say that anymore. Let's not say that. Let's just say, I love you. I love you because I know God loves you. I love you no matter who you love. I love you that you are able to love, that you have found a loving and wonderful relationship. That's one of the places that I've seen the word sin used incorrectly. That I've seen the word sin used against people that need love. We all do, don't we? We are all children of God, and who is it for any of us to decide who's not? So what's sin about? If it's not that, what is it? I also remember growing up learning that sin is a broken relationship with God. I like that better than saying sin is about people who don't follow the rules. What rules? Whose rules? What do we mean by rules? Marcus Borg can help us some with that. In his book, Meeting God Again for the First Time, he talks about how it's not our understanding of sin that's a problem at all. It's not about which rules make us sinners when we break them. It's not about what we don't do or do do that makes us sinners. It's about understanding our relationship with God. Marcus Borg says that in a society or a system, actually, in a system that sees God as a king or a ruler, then it is about appeasing and following the rules. That if we see God as some being over us who creates a system of rules that if we don't follow them, we have broken our relationship that if we don't follow the rules, we won't be the children of God anymore. He says that that's where we get in trouble, worrying about sin. But he says that we shouldn't have that kind of understanding or relationship with God. His book is all about how we understand God. If you haven't read it, it's a good one. He says that when we have a spiritual relationship with God, then sin isn't about following a list of rules and getting them right or wrong but it's about examining our relationship. Back to that idea of a broken relationship with God. Being in connection with God. Being in relationship. 
And sin is getting in that, the way of that relationship. He goes on to say that when we have relationship with God, the way we sin is when other things become more important, other relationships, perhaps. Maybe our relationship with our possessions, our relationship with substance abuse, our relationship with all kinds of things, you can name them. When those things get in the way of our relationship with God, that's when we've committed sin. Not when we don't follow some checklist. In some ways, it sounds harder. It would be a lot easier if the Methodist Church would say to me, here's a checklist, Stephanie. Here's a checklist to all of you out there. Don't break any of these rules and you won't sin. Wouldn't that be good? But it doesn't quite work that way, does it? It doesn't make sense. If I give you, and I know some of you out there, if I gave you a list of rules, you would try all you could to break them. And what happens then is we begin to hurt people. We don't always understand all circumstances. But when it's about my relationship with God, with a spiritual relationship, with a loving, caring being, then what I have to do is return that love and that care and not worry about others, rules, but worry about other people and their feelings and their relationship and how can I help it grow? And what can I do to be an influencer in a good way? And really, it's about me and my relationship. Uh, my secretary and I continued this conversation and she said to me, you don't understand. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about at all. I know that we are all sinners because we all fall short in our relationship with God. And yet we are all forgiven and we can all continue to read the scripture, even in church. I said to her, if church was only led by people who don't sin, there'd be nobody up here. There'd be nobody out there either if only non-sinners were allowed in the church. Sin is difficult to think about, but it goes back to that idea of we are all God's beloved children. We are all filled with God's love and building and nurturing our relationship with God. That will keep us from sinning, not all the time, but it'll keep us growing stronger and stronger. I have to go back to grace for a minute because to me, no conversation about sin is complete without grace. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, talked about moving on towards perfection. He said that he didn't know if it was possible or not, but that we should strive for perfection. And he doesn't mean perfection in the sense that it's dangerous or bad for us, the kind of perfection we think of now. No, no. He said that perfection Perfection is having our hearts so filled with God's love, there is no room to sin. I, I'm not there, but I want to keep trying. How about you? To have our hearts so filled with God's love, with that relationship with God, that out of that, there's just not room for much else. I like that. Because then that first part of the scripture becomes so again. We are God's children. God wants what's best for all of us. Do you love God that much? Are you that filled with a spiritual relationship? I pray that you are. And some days we might have to work on it harder than others. Some days we'll do what Wesley said and backslide. Some days we will sin. And sin meaning we'll lose part of our relationship with God. And we'll have to work on it and grow in it some more. But isn't it exciting to be on that journey, on the way to perfection, to work on our hearts being filled with that love? This Easter tide, this season of Easter, is a great time to think about things like sin and not using them as a weapon but to remind ourselves that we want that loving relationship with God. I pray for you all this week a chance to stop, to think about sin for yourself, 
Think about times maybe you've used it as a weapon by accusing someone of sinning. And to stop and look within your heart, reminding yourself that God loves you. And falling deeper and deeper in love with God. Falling so deeply in love with God that sin isn't a factor. What wonderful time to do that as we remember the events of Easter, the story of resurrection, and that great love and joy we feel being Easter people. Amen. Frederick Faber's glorious text is familiar to us in a different setting, but the music of Calvin Hampton sets the tone and space for the very wideness we are singing about. Allow yourself to become familiar with this beautiful melody. In describing God, Faber's poem uses everyday words such as mercy, kindness, justice, welcome, and healing, and equated God's mercy to the wideness of the sea. The final stanza can be sung softly as a prayer of both confession and calm assurance. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice which is more Go from this place, remembering that you are a child of God. Go in peace. Amen.